Uh, Dr. Stuart Smythe is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Resource Economics at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, and there he holds the Agri-Food Innovation and Sustainability Enhancement Chair. And his research focuses on sustainability, agriculture, innovation, and food. Dr. Smythe publishes a weekly blog, which uh, is a very interesting blog, by the way, very good content. It's at safe, S-A-I-F, food.ca. Uh, he has well over 150 academic publications and is recognized as a leading expert on barriers to innovation and regulatory efficiency. So uh, that's Dr. Smythe's area of expertise. Um, and so uh, today, he's going to talk about that from the perspective uh, of this conversation that we've been having today. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Smythe. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know I stand between you and a drink, so I'll try to be as uh, brief as I, concise as I can. Thank you very much to SIP and, and Daniel and, and Orno for the invitation to travel here this afternoon. So I want to just quickly acknowledge and thank uh, the stakeholders in my research chair. You can see a, a variety of public sector, private sector, and producer-based uh, organizations there. So I'm fortunate enough to have a, a P4 research chair. I think the big challenge, and, and it's been laid out really clearly with Ray and, and Vilnius's talk about the science moving ahead of our regulatory capacity. So how do we sort of jumpstart the regulatory side of things so that we're not sitting there with technologies waiting months, years? If you've ever heard anybody from Okanagan specialty fruits with uh, how many years it took to get Arctic apples approved. 14, 15 years. Aqua Bounty, again, over a, a dozen years to get these technologies approved and into the marketplace. So where is, are we at in Canada in terms of gene editing regulation right now? Well, essentially, last spring, Health Canada came out and said, if the mutation would have naturally occurred and there's no foreign DNA included in the plant variety, then all of the regulations that were developed for genetically modified crops, which we call plants with novel traits, none of that will apply. So you can imagine how horrified the environmental community was from this because they raised a lot of money by misleading the public about the dangers of biotechnology. And and so they are going to lose their opportunity to extend that fundraising through gene editing because now it's just going to be treated as conventional plant breeding. So this is a huge removal of a barrier. We had surveyed ab about 25% of the public and private plant breeders in Canada and we found that when they self-identified that a new crop variety was going to be a PNT, they threw it in the garbage. So we were killing one-third of our plant breeding capacity because PNTs were a barrier to innovation. So that shows that we're starting to, to remove significant barriers. So I've touched briefly on a couple of things, but the, the real challenge is Canada has no regulatory framework for dealing with even genetically modified animals, let alone something that would move us into the genetic, you know, genetically engineered space. So we have some research exemptions which um, have, have been approved here. You can see, so Guelph got approval for um, the Enviro pig that they were working on. Metacago, um, pharmaceutical based company out of Quebec had approval for GM goats. Uh, mice are used throughout the health sector, so we've got genetically modified mice and rats. And then the one, we have approved glowfish. So you could go to a, a pet store and you could buy a genetically modified glowfish. Um, and, and interestingly, these are approved in the states, but in some of the southern states, they're actually finding them showing up in the environment. Because when parents get sick of their kids' fish, they're flushing it down the toilet. And these fish, fish these genetically modified glowfish are now showing up in some of the Everglades. So, so they will get where they're not supposed to be. So... In terms of some other applications of non-plant biotech commercializations, uh, you can see that mosquitoes 
were one of the first ones done seven year, eight years ago, I guess now, in, in um, Brazil, trying to control the spread of uh, a variety of diseases, but the first one really focused on this controlling the mosquitoes that spread dengue fever. And you can see they had a tremendous success. 96% reduction in population rates by, by putting sterile mosquitoes out um, into the environment. And then two years ago, Oxitec again got approval to do this in Florida, um, reducing the spread of Zika, dengue, and yellow fever, and have approval for this for California. They received uh, last year, and they still have not announced when they're going to roll out the release in California. Uh, the best I could find on Oxitec's website is they're hoping to be able to do that uh, sometime this calendar year. And, and one of the interesting ones that, that I just received notice of from Environment Canada last week was um, they're looking at genetically modifying fruit flies to be a, a bioactor for proteins. And so if you have any interest, uh, you can go to Environment Canada's website and they're looking for public comments. I'm, I'm not going to comment this. I'm leaving this to, to Ray and Vilnius to, to do these kind of comments. It's way beyond my capacity. But it shows you how rapidly the science is advancing when, when scientists are looking at all different kinds. You know, So we've been talking about pigs, um, plants. We're now we're using insects in labs to produce protein. So, so really, the science is moving at an incredibly rapid pace. And so we've touched on this a little bit, but I really wanted to get into where is gene editing going to be a potential benefit for the Canadian hog sector. So here's the value over the last decade. We export about $5 billion worth of uh, pork in Canada on an annual basis. About a million and a half uh, tons, 70% of what we produce in this country is exported internationally. And, and you can see the predominant markets are the United States and a number of countries in Asia. So what happened when BSE hit the livestock sector? So that's a 20-year-old story now. The Canadian cattle industry had nothing planned. They didn't have a single action plan. They didn't have any strategies as to how to deal with a potential detection of BSE. So what happened? We went from exporting over $4 billion of beef in 2002 to exporting virtually zero in 2003. So it destroyed our beef export capacity for close to two years. Canada did manage to negotiate an agreement that you can see they allowed the export of boneless beef under livestock less than 30 months old. But it took between two and three years for all of the testing to go through Canada to put a protocol in place. And so what happened is, you know, almost two years after that first case was detected, there was over a million extra head of livestock on farms. So you, it drove up all of our production costs, right? So stuff that would have been killed at 18, you know, 16 to 18 months were now being held on to 24, 30, you know, plus months. So farmers were losing more money per hoof than they had previously. Some of the outbreaks of African swine flu, so research has estimated that the outbreak in China a couple of years ago cost their economy you know, about $14 billion US dollars. And then you can track the spread of this disease throughout Europe. So going back over a decade ago, it was identified in Russia and Belarus. It moved into three other countries. And by the end of 19, it was present in nine EU countries. And some research out of Denmark showing that every time there's an outbreak, it's costing them somewhere between 250 million and 380 million euros. So there's substantial cost associated with every time there's an outbreak of African swine flu. So where does that leave Canada? If we look at the side of the zoonotic diseases, it cost about half a trillion dollars a year, both in economic slowdown and, and in ac actual economic um, food safety, transportation, export losses. 
And then it's some numbers out of the CDC, out of the US, saying that you know, over six out of every 10 diseases are coming uh, or are, can be spread by animals, and three quarters of the new and emerging ones are coming from livestock to humans. And the experts on some of the, the articles I were looking at are saying that they're expecting this trend to increase over the certainly over the remainder of this decade. So Cam, when you ask sort of where is the public on this, we haven't looked at, at that too much. We, we looked a little bit at um, using the, the milk from the gene edited dairy cows as part of our research, um, and I'll touch on that. So we first asked this question in 2018 about gene editing, and two-thirds of Canadians said that this is not natural. Then two years later, we did another survey where we were asking about uh, a couple, three G E technologies, one of which was the milk. Yeah, again, you can see that there's still an awful lot of uncertainty about the application of this technology. And again, slightly over half of the people that responded to our survey said this is not a natural technology. And those comments show up throughout both of the surveys we've done that have looked at gene editing. The lack of public knowledge and awareness about this technology even though it's a controlled mutagenesis, the public has no idea that radiation or chemical mutagenesis has been used to develop plants since the 1930s. They get really horrified when you tell them that all of the organic varieties they're eating have been developed by, ra or many of them have been developed by radiation mutagenesis. It's a story the organic industry certainly doesn't want the public to hear. So that's why talking about technologies that have been producing our food for decades and safely producing it is part of the package of information that we need to start communicating. I think one of the things that, that may really fundamentally drive at least the discussion and conversations around using gene editing is that one of the things we should expect as an ag sector is protectionism is going to increase. We've seen numerous examples and as as, as Canadians, we're really aware of how China is using phytosanitary issues that they cannot validate, but they're using them to halt exports for a period of time. These types of practices, not only by China, but other parts of the world, should be expected to be con you know, continue and possibly even increase over the coming decade. And now, when something happens that information is communicated instantaneously around the world. So the story last year where there was a BSE positive cow tested in Alberta, there was Asian countries implementing, a, you know, putting, putting the potential in to ban all Canadian meat exports within 12 hours. So that is how rapid countries are, have the capability to put in trade restricting actions when something is identified. So I think that one of the most important things that not just the, the hog sector, but certainly I think it's in a very important part of it, is that containment strategies, proactive planning needs to be included as part of the looking forward plan. So the surveys we've done on consumer acceptance are all saying that sustainability is one of the most fundamental factors that consumers want when they're in a grocery store. So this gives the opportunity to the Canadian pork sector to say, here's what we're doing to promote sustainability. Here's what we're doing to promote health in terms of ensuring that zoonotic diseases are not being, tr or at least have the potential to be transported from wild pigs to domestic pigs and then on to, to you and I. And the messaging is going to be framed by whoever enters the space first. Some of you may not be old enough to remember Greenpeace's campaign against um, Newfoundland, you know, the sea, um, harvesting of, of seal pups on the East Coast. But they used a white seal pup, and that triggered a lot of money. It was a huge fundraiser for them. So imagine if Canadian agriculture stepped out and started using a baby duck, saying, 
this is what's being destroyed by these wild pigs. And then you've got a picture of a ferocious looking wild boar. Who's the public going to sympathize with? They're going to sympathize with the cute little yellow duckling. Right? So it's all about that messaging. Certainly the knowledge, the science has to be part of it. But we also have to understand that those people that are fighting against science and innovation within agriculture are going to be appealing to the public's emotions. And we would be naive as an industry if we did not include something in our messaging that appeals to the public's emotional sentiments about these technologies. So if we show them a picture of a helpless duckling being eaten by a wild boar, we can say we need to put technologies in place to protect ducklings and, and waterfowl across the country as part of these plans. So that's it for me. Um, you can follow me, you can follow Safe Food. Um, there's our web address and, and our contact information to, uh, to keep on top of, of what we're talking about. So thank you very much for your attention.